Hi, welcome back to Wi-Fi Trainings Designing Outdoor Wireless Solutions. I'm your instructor, Jim Palmer, and today we're going to get into lesson number two, which is 802.11 for outdoor review. So before we get into any of this stuff, we really got to have, let's do a deep dive into the 802.11 Phi standards and what they bring in and why different things can help us or also hurt us when we start talking about outdoor wireless design. So the 802.11 standard goes back to 1997. And then it comes all the way up to a couple of years ago when 802.11 AX came into play. Now this is a nice eye chart that you can look at and you can find this chart in, in numerous different places. So I'm not going to go too far into this. But what I do want to talk about is there was there's a change, there's a fundamental change that happened. And it happened right here between 802.11G and 802.11N. And most people would just go, oh yeah, that's when we went to HT and we have MCS rates and not, you know, some of the more legacy rates that we saw. And the speeds also went up. But one of the things that allowed the speeds to go up was the idea of multipath. Now, previous to 802.11G or N, it, when 802.11G was in, multipath was actually a problem. We didn't want to get multipath. We didn't want to have multiple signals coming into our receivers, you know, and confusing it or possibly even corrupting the signal that we received or that receiving AP got. And when they realized, when they figured out how to actually use multipath as a tool and not a hindrance, then all of a sudden the speeds really started to go up. That's when we started seeing, you know, two by twos and three by threes and four by fours and now eight by eight radios that have, you know, eight transmitters, eight receivers and eight spatial streams. And all of this stuff is one of the building blocks along with the faster modulation and encoding that was able to us to push the boundaries and the limits of how much data we could send and how fast we could send it. You know, with 802.11n, we could get up to 600 megabits per second as they increased the bandwidth and the spatial streams and the transmitters. We're now up to 9.6 gigabits per second. And when 802.11be comes out, I suspect that's going to be well over 10 gigabits per second delivered from, potentially delivered from an AP to a client. But multipath relies on something to bounce off of. Now, as we talked about in the last lesson, you know, some outdoor spaces, we literally have no multipath. In other outdoor spaces, like stadiums and arenas, we probably have even more multipath than we'd ever, ever want to have. And so understanding what's capable and what's possible, especially when we move from indoors to outdoors, is really going to help you understand, especially when you have to explain to somebody why you can't get 9.6 gigabits per second in an outdoor setting. It's just not going to happen. So that's kind of, I mean, there's a lot more we could talk about, but most of you probably know this and seen it. I just wanted to hit on it real quick and draw out that difference of when we move from indoor to outdoor, those spatial streams aren't always possible because they don't follow us. Now, the one advantage that we do have with 802.11ax are the longer guard intervals. Now, that might seem weird when we start, when I bring this up, but when we talk about longer distances, you want to have, because it takes longer for the signals to get from point A to point B, longer guard intervals allows us to have a cleaner operating environment. It might slow us down a little bit when we start talking about how much data we can move. But for the most part, outdoor data isn't talking about moving gigs of data you know, per second. It's more about you know reliability and re resiliency as opposed to overall throughput. So that long guard interval with 802.11ax assists in these outdoor deployments by saying, you know what, we're going to kind of stretch this time out a little bit to give my signals time to get from point A to point B, because we are talking about much greater distances, which then gives us a more stable connection. Now, when we talk about measuring distances and, and what we get, we need to talk a little bit about measuring a signal's strength. Now, there's two major terms that we want to talk about here, RSSI and receive sensitivity. Now, RSSI is Received Signal Strength Indicator. And this is a relative metric that's used by the radio to measure signal strength. It's expressed in dBMs, decibels per milliwatt, 
is represented as an absolute value. And it's specific to each vendor, if we're getting you know, into the weeds on this, in that each vendor has a different way that they report RSSI. And then it's up to the OS to then try to translate that reporting from each vendor to try to figure out, oh, if he's reporting a metric, you know, a RSSI of 200, which is zero, usually between zero and 255 is what we're looking at. The question is, well, what does that actually mean when we start talking about receive sensitivity or actual radio levels that you would read on a spectrum analyzer? Because those are actually set in DBMs and displayed in DBMs. So the receive sensitivity of a, of a radio is the minimum signal strength that's required to decode a signal. And this varies, you know, with just about everything you can think of, devices, frequencies, you name it. But more complex modulations, like, a, you know, MCS 11 in 802.11ax requires a stronger signal to be decoded because it needs a much, has a much smaller error vector magnitude in order to make this work. And so here on the table on the right, you can see sort of a kind of a, a, a relationship between the data rates that, and the receive sensitivity. Now, what you'll notice is as we go from one megabit per second, where, you know, the receive sensitivity is like you need a minus 101, which everybody should be going, holy cow, holy cow, that's really low, you know, all the way up to when we start looking at MCS zero, when a neg 90 or... 54 megabits per second, which is a neg 79. And then we get into those higher MCS rates where even at an MCS, you know, of seven or 15 or 23, we're still looking at actually a, a pretty weak signal when we start talking about what we design for in Wi-Fi. I mean, in neg 74, most people are like, I don't want my, my client device anywhere near operating at a neg 74 in an indoor scenario because I want them up in the neg 65. That's where we generally des design to. We're talking about 9 dB difference here between what's capable and what we want. Now, the other half that we look at when we talk, start talking about measuring a signal strength is we start talking about measuring the noise. Now, what is noise? Now, noise is just the background level of energy in the spectrum. It doesn't necessarily have to be a modulated signal that we can see on one of our tools. Although that does contribute to the noise, it can be anything. It can be a light fixture. It can be a microwave. It can be, you know, any number of things that generates electronic magnetic interference or EMI. And the noise is measured in DBM. Now, if you've ever looked at a traditional and actual real spectrum analyzer, what you'll see is that the noise isn't just this flat, steady line like we see in pictures, and we'll see in the pictures in a little bit. It actually fluctuates a lot. So what we try to do is we try to look at what is the average, what is the general reading, because it gen because it will go up and down, you know, by two dB in any direction. And so when we look at it, a four dB swing, we kind of go, we can't deal with that. That's it, because it fluctuates so fast. So we try to look at it as a sort of an average in dbm and like i said it can be a modulated signal it can be broadband or it can be unmodulated anything can generate emi electric motors can generate emi any of these things can raise the noise floor so when we start taking a look at you know how this works together it changes all the time and other wi-fi signals on the same on the same channel they also create noise which is we see as cci but it's modulated. And of course, when we get above a certain level, then the clear channel assessment fails and everything. And it gets, and then we get co-channel interference, co-channel contention, depending on how you want to call it. Now, when you have non-Wi-Fi energy, you have CCA. And like I said, EMI from nearby devices, they'll create noise, but they'll also create it across the entire spectrum. It's not like we see when we see that one little, you know, thing on our spectrum, anal spectrum analyzer, whichever tool we're using that says, Hey, you know, here's my signal. No, what happens is the whole entire noise floor will raise up and down as a whole. And so that's something that we contend with. Now, when we take our signal and we compare it to the noise, what we see is what we get is what's known as SNR or signal to noise ratio. And that is this, the strength of the signal measured in dbm and the strength of the noise also measured in dbm and then we get a we actually get a ratio 
So as we see here with an RSSI of neg 60 and a noise level of neg 90, we get a nice SNR of 30 dB. Now it's not dBm, it's actually measured in dB because what we're, we're not talking, it's not relative to a milliwatt, it's just simply we're looking at the absolute difference between the RSSI or the received signal and the noise level. And so the noise can go up and the RSSI stays the same, then our SNR goes down. So say we were looking at a, you know, this is a 20 megahertz wide channel and then we double it to a 40. Well, the noise level goes up. So now the noise level would be at a neg 93, not a neg 90, which means my SNR is now down to a 27. So the difference between, or not neg 90, you go to neg 87. So the difference between 60 and neg 60 and neg 87 is going to be 27 dB. And so that's how it's represented. Now, the higher the signal to noise, the better the quality. And so this can be, this can be impacted by simply either raising our RSSI or decreasing the noise. Either one of those, so even if your RSSI is lower, if you can decrease the noise, you can still get to that those higher SNR values instead of getting to a lower SNR value. And when you get a really low one and a receiver can't decode the signal, it never sends the acknowledgement. Without an acknowledgement, the devices then retransmit. So SNR. Now, what goes into making up the SNR? I mean, how does this all kind of fit together? Now for an internal antenna AP, all of this stuff that we're seeing here is all in, you know, is all inside that cover. It's inside that case and we never see it and we don't have to mess with it. When we start talking about outdoor, then all of a sudden we start talking about the different components and we need to take a look at those to understand what are those components and how they impact us and how we can, you know, how they can help us and how they can hurt us when we do outdoor wireless. Now, the first one, we have a transmitter. That's easy. And then we have a receiver. Well, that's easy. That's the guy on the other end. Now, what's not pictured here is the fact that when we start talking about these RF components, most of the time, what you'll see them labeled as is a transceiver. Now, a transceiver is simply a transmitter and a receiver in a single package. And so for our APs, when we think about it, the AP is really a transceiver because it has both a transmitter and a receiver. Now, what you'll what you'll see happen if you were really get into the logic of, of how this works on the on the components and the on the board inside the AP, is those little boxes there between the antenna cable and the antenna actually is a micro switch. And what that does is it says when I'm transmitting, I'm going to connect my antennas to my transmitter. And then when I'm receiving, I'm going to swing that back over and my antenna, my antennas, depending on your scenario, will attach to the receiver. So there's still a different transmitter and a different receiver inside the box, but within the box itself, we will call it a transceiver. Now, then we have an antennas and then an attenuation. Now, attenuation and amplifiers, the two things, you know, they're on our list. There are things that happen that we have to realize with RF components, and we'll get into a lot of that when we start talking about the antenna um, details and cables specific stuff and connectors and sort of that part in the next lesson we'll get into more of the attenuation and the amplifiers now amplifier has a little uh, asterisk there because you should never put an amplifier in a wi-fi system some people will do it some people will make it but you shouldn't do it because it amplifies everything and it doesn't do it very well and when that amplifier goes with what's called non-linear and it goes a little wonky and crazy, it will take and it will spread RF noise across your entire spectrum. So they work uh, okay when they're working good. They never, they never ever work great, but they'll work okay. But when they go bad, they go really, really bad and they can take out everything and you can get in trouble. So an amplifier is a component. It actually exists inside of the radio inside the transceiver housing. But as far as adding an amplifier between, you know, when we start talking about an external antenna AP that has its RF connector and you run a cable to an antenna, some people are like, well, if I'm running the cable and I got to drop in, you know, a lightning arrestor, which adds attenuation, I might as well drop in an amplifier that's going to then boost that up. But I really suggest you don't ever do that. And then the last thing we have here is the antenna system. Now, I call it an antenna system because it really is a 
bunch of different things that you combine together to make it all work. And that's outlined here in this gold box. Everything between the transceiver out is going to be part of a system. There's connectors, there's cables, you know, you have the antennas, you have arresters, you have bulkhead connectors, you have all kinds of different things that you can have within the system. And it works together as a system, either for to improve it or as a hindrance. So that's the antenna system. And we'll kind of touch on this after we go over the RF power math. Now I'm hoping that for the most, most of you, this RF power math is sort of a refresher. And this, what this does is this is a, tells us how we get from you know, DBMs to watts or milliwatts or really low milliwatts. Now, the general rule behind all this, and again, this is, should just be a refresher for most of you, is that for every three DBM, you either double if you're going up or you have the power. So if you go from three DBM to six DBM, so you add three DBM, you then double the power. So we go from two milliwatts to four milliwatts. Um, if you're going 10 dBm, and this is where we get the what's known as the rules of threes and tens, 10 dBm is either 10 times the power if you're going up, or it's one tenth the power. So if we go from um, 10 dBm, if we go from 10 dBm to, to 20 dBm, 10 milliwatts, then 10 times 10 milliwatts gives us 100 milliwatts. So that's where we see that. Now, if we go down, then it's one tenth the power. So you divide by 10. 3 dBm, if you go 3 dB down, which would be from say 6 dBm to 3 dBm, you half the power. So from four milliwatts, four divided by two gives us two. Now that's really easy when we start talking about, you know, some of these positive numbers where, we're, you know, zero dBm, which is relative to one milliwatt. And that's kind of that break even point because it is zero dBm. We start getting down into these lower numbers. You know, you start taking a look at, well, what does, you know, minus 50 dBm, that's relative to point zero 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 one milliwatt. Now that's a mouthful to say. So we just say neg 50. And then we know that if it's a neg 53, we've gone down three dB. It's now half the power. Now, when we take a look at this and we add this into our antenna system that we were looking at before, what we see is, is we have our data is sent and then it's transmitted at 20 milliwatts. We then have loss through the cable. We then have gain at the antenna. So my antenna system actually has a positive or a plus 10 dB influence on the 20 milliwatts that's sent. Well, then when we run it, then we have free space path loss that's between the two antennas. Then we have the antenna gain. Well, then we also have loss on that side. Now, when we take all these numbers and we add them up together, what we'll see is we have, you know, 13 dBm minus 3 dB plus 13 dB minus 63 dB plus 10 dB minus 3 dB equals 33 dBm or 0 0.00005 milliwatts or a negative 33 dBm that is our, our SSI value at the receiver. So hopefully most of you realize that even with 63 dB of loss in free space path loss, you know, we're looking at a, a minus 33 RSSI value, which is very, very, very strong. Most of the time we're, we're happy if we're at a neg 53 or 23 B, 20 dB down from what we have right here. And then once we get that RSSI value, then we actually have the data that's received off that because we have to get to the RSSI of neg 33 before we go, okay, that's something we can decode. And then our data is received. Now, what I want to talk about is all of these little connection points here that I've highlighted with the arrows. Now, each one of those is a connector because we have to connect, you know, as we go from, you know, the transmitter to my lightning arrestor, from my lightning arrestor to my antenna. So there's four connectors right there. And then on the, on the receive side, I have another four connectors as I go from my antenna to my arrestor and from my arrestor to my receiver. Now, each one of those connectors is about a quarter dBm of loss. Now, the lightning arrestors that we have in here are also a quarter dBm of loss. So in this scenario, we lose a half of a dB in 
in arrestors and we lose 2 dB in, in connectors. So we're looking at 2.5 dB of loss across this for all of those little things. So the cable itself is actually doing quite well, if we're being honest. And so understanding how these work together, when we take a look at our antenna system and we compare it to the RF power math example, you know, gives us a better idea of how do we plan this because we know what we need to receive on the other end. And so as we know the distance that our links have to travel, especially outdoors, we can then start using this type of RF power math to calculate, well, what type of gain of antennas do I need? Because I know I need a certain RSSI value on the other side because of the amount of data that I'm trying to move, which means I need a specific RSSI. Now, real quick, before we finish this up, I want to take a look at something that caught my eye in some pictures we were looking at. So this is the point to point link picture that I used in the last lesson. And what I want you to point out, what I wanted to point out and notice is that in this particular scenario, what they've done is they've taken the transceivers and they basically bolted them to the backside of the antenna. That means they can incorporate everything that we were looking at before into their design and they can actually reduce the amount of attenuation that we have by running through all these components because it's all in a single element. So this is where understanding how that, that RF power math works in our antenna system gets you to designs like this. And they've done this because they don't want any of that loss. They're trying to keep as much signal as they can between the transmitter as it goes to the antenna and then from the antenna to the receiver. So last thing I want to talk about real quick is EIRP or equivalent isotropic radiated power. Now, what this means is this is simply the RF strength as it's radiated from the antenna. And it's a critical value, especially in outdoor wireless, because indoors, EIRP is really, you know, all of this stuff is really contained within the building. When we go outdoors, now we start going into the realm of other people. Now, the EIRP is simply your transmitter power, 13 dB, minus any loss that you have through your antenna system plus your antenna gain so in this case our, you know we have an eirp of 23 dbm now this is really highly regulated by the different regulate regulatory domains that you may be operating in so understanding what is your eirp will help you not get in trouble from a legal perspective because you can say Oh, especially in 802.11, I'm just going to dump, you know, bump that up to 45 dBm EIRP. And that's when the guys with the, you know, the black SUV show up and tell you to knock it off. And that is measured at this point right there as it leaves the antenna. No free space path loss is calculated. The EIRP is the power radiated calculated at the antenna as it, as it leaves the antenna. Now, the last thing I want to touch on is PSD which is power spectral density. This is a new term that's come about with the six gigahertz stuff. Now you might be telling me at this point, well, we don't have six gigahertz outdoors because we don't have AFC, but there's a reason I'm bringing this up and we'll do, we'll tie into this later because for right now, it's only used for LPI, which is low power indoors and very low power, which is indoor and outdoor. But there is a reason why we're talking about this. Um, at six gigahertz and, we'll, and that actually comes up in the mesh stuff. And because of that, the outdoor VLP is going to be a very unique niche, niche case of how we use this. But it is something to think about as we start going forward because eventually we will have an AFC and we will be able to use six gigahertz outdoors. And so this will come into play when we get into the mesh stuff in one of the later lessons. So that's it for this lesson. Thank you for joining me. Again, um, Wi-Fi training, you can find us on all of these different uh, social media accounts, uh, like follow for deals that we run on the different classes, and this is how you can get a hold of us. So thank you for joining me today for outdoor wireless design, and I hope you'll join me next time when we go into antenna fundamentals. Thank you.